Welcome to Grace Church International. We are blessed to have you today. Our vision. The fulfillment of the great commandment by loving God and others. And the fulfillment of the great commission through the multiplication of disciples. Our strategy is to win, connect, train and send. going to sing a song declares he is the king of kings the lord of lords the name above every name he's worthy of our greatest praise I just want to Jesus. 
the only God who we know, God. There is none compares to you, Lord. We worship you, Lord.
Today is another day to celebrate the goodness of God. It's Friday again. Thank you for joining with us. Stay and be blessed with our topic, Destroy Your Tormentors. A day when death turns to life. This is a story of the Jewish people who did not go back to Jerusalem after the 70 years of captivity under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. When King Cyrus conquered Babylon, he gave an order to the people who were taken captives to go home. This included the Jews. But many did not return to their homeland and stayed in the places where they had been carried off. This was the case of Esther's family and her cousin Mordecai in Persia under the reign of King Ahasuerus or Xerxes. He is best known for leading the massive invasion of Greece. His powerful empire spread from India to Ethiopia during 486 BC to 465 BC. He was known to be an impulsive and headstrong man. One time, a feast that lasted 180 days, that is six months, was held to show off the glory and greatness of the king and his kingdom. When he was drunk, he wanted to boast in front of the people how beautiful is his wife, Queen Vasti. But Queen Vasti refused. The king was angry. His own wife was refusing him in front of all men of Susa. The royal wise men advised the king that Vasti's humiliating behavior could not go unpunished. So Queen Vasti banished. And a search began for a new queen. Many beautiful virgins were chosen from the kingdom and among them Esther, the Jewish girl. In God's providence, Esther was eventually made queen in Vasti's place. It was through Esther's exalt exalted position in the palace that God later preserved his people from annihilation. The book of Esther is the only book in the Bible that does not mention God at all. But the hand of God is evident throughout the book. Let's hear this beautiful story that even the actions of the wicked are controlled by God in His plan to do good for His chosen people and for all who trust in Him. God can turn evil to good. Our message is from the book of Esther. Haman was promoted. He became a prime minister during the reign of King Xerxes in Persia. But he was not happy when one man did not show honor to him. That is in chapter 3 verse 2 and 3. When all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, but Mordecai would not bow or pay any reverence. What was the reason of Mordecai for not bowing to Haman? Mordecai told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. He sought to kill not only Mordecai, but all the Jews who were throughout the kingdom of King Xerxes. Who is Mordecai? A Jew. And Jews kept the Ten Commandments wherever they are and no matter what. Let's read Exodus chapter 20 verses 3 to 5. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now let's see. 
the prohibition of bowing down applies only to bowing down to or to showing respect for other gods. But the respect or to respect or submit to other individuals who are in authority like kings, prophets, or parents is an action that is appropriate for us as believers. When Abraham bought a burial plot from the Hittite people, he bowed to them twice. Genesis chapter 23 verse 7 and 12. And Joseph bowed to his father Jacob before he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. Genesis 48 verse 12. And here are more examples of bowing. Genesis 18 to Abraham before the three men or angels. Joshua chapter 5 13 to 14. Joshua to the commander of the army of the Lord, 1 Chronicles 21, 16, David and the elders before the judging angel, and Daniel chapter 10, verses 8 to 12 and verse 15, bowing before an angel. Now, let's have a look who was Haman. According to the Jewish tradition, Haman the Agagite was a direct offspring of King Agag, the king of the Amalekites that is in 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 8. Thus, Agag was the enemy of the Jews. Haman is a prime minister and next to the king in authority. He deserved respect and honor, but Mordecai, cannot and will not bow to Haman. Why? Because Haman wore a medallion around his neck or a symbol on his turban of an idol. That's why Mordecai will not bow to Haman. Haman's promotion and fame throughout the 127 provinces in the kingdom of King Xerxes of Persia are no worth to him. His life evolves only with one person, Mordecai. And now, to satisfy his rage, he includes all Jews in the kingdom. In order for Haman's evil desire to materialize, a law has to be given to make it legal and authoritative he needs the king's approval and he managed to convince the king that the jews are in rebellion against his authority now let's read esther chapter 3 verses 7 to 15. so in the month of april during the 12th year of king Xerxes' reign lots were cast in haman's presence the lots were called Purim to determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7, nearly a year later. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, There is a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. The laws are different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So, it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed, and I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver, around 20 million U.S. dollars, to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. If the cost of a private jet is 3 million US dollars, meron ka ng pitong private jets na pwedeng sakyan ang mga gustong magbakasyon. Let's continue. In verse 10, the king agreed, confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, son of Hamidata the Agagai, the enemy of the Jews. 
The king said, The money and the people are both yours to do it as you see fit. Kakalungkot naman. So on April 17, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. It was sent to the king's highest officers, the governors of the respective provinces, and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and languages. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Dispatches were sent by sweet messengers into all the provinces of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7 of the next year. And the property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. A copy of this decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all peoples, so that they would be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. At the king's command, the decree went out by sweet messengers, and it was also proclaimed in the fortress of Susa. Then the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa fell into confusion. In chapter 4, Mordecai told Queen Esther to go to the king and ask for help. At once, the queen was reluctant to go because it's been a month now that she did not see the king. Nung papala, uso na ang social distancing. Now, because of any bacteria or virus, but they have a law. This is the law. If any man or woman, that includes the queen, approaches the king without any request, they are going to die unless the king has to extend the royal scepter as a sign of his approval now let's go to verse 3 in every province to which the edict and order of the king came there was great mourning among the jews with fasting weeping and wailing the man mordecai knew very well the power of prayer and fasting he might have heard the story of Ezra regarding seeking the Lord's face by prayer and fasting, and the Lord delivered them from their enemies. Here is the challenge for Queen Esther. She is also a Jew, like cousin Mordecai said. That means she is not exempted from the decree of annihilation of all the Jews. So Esther said, Go gather all the Jews that are present in Susa and observe a fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids also will fast in the same way. Then I will go in to see the king without being summoned, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. This is the first appearance of Queen Esther before the king. Now we are in chapter 5. Three days later, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court just beyond the royal hall of the palace, where the king was sitting upon his royal throne. And when he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her, holding out the golden scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched its tip. Then the king asked her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? 
I will give it to you even if it is half the kingdom. When the king says, I'll give it to you even if it is half of the kingdom, meaning that he would grant her anything and everything that was reasonable and even magnificent. During the first appearance, actually, the queen, the queen or Esther did not say about her major request. Instead, she invited the king with Haman for a banquet. And during that second appearance where Haman was there, the queen again did not tell her her request. Instead, she said, come back again tomorrow for another banquet. And now this is the third appearance, the request of Queen Esther. Queen Esther said to King Xerxes, If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold. She was repairing to the money that Haman offered the king that money is to be put into the government's treasury, but the king did not actually accept it. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we have merely been sold as slave, I could remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king so how serious is the matter it's not just a problem of not having enough food supply so that they will die for hunger or for slavery it's about annihilation a complete destruction of the Jews or destruction of lives the killing of the Jews is to be done in one day to kill, destroy, and annihilate both young and old, little children and women just in one day. Then the king asked Queen Esther, who would do such a thing? King Xerxes demanded, who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. To shorten the story, Haman was punished. The gallows he prepared for Mordecai was the gallows that took his life. Let's hear what Proverbs 26, 27 is saying. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. Yes, Haman the Gigite, the enemy of the Jews, is dead. The king gave the property of Haman to Queen Esther, and Mordecai was brought to King Xerxes, and Queen Esther told him how they were related. And another promotion to Mordecai, the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai to be in charge of Haman's property. What a relief! But it's not yet time for the Jews to celebrate and smile. Why? Because Haman left something so terrifying even after his death the king's decree that decree that put fear in the hearts of all the jews is still on effect why even if their enemy is dead the, that decree is so alive and on progress 
to take the lives of Queen Esther, cousin Mordecai, and all the Jews. How powerful is that law? May kasabihan tayo na ang utos ng hari ay hindi nababali. Verse 8 Whatever has already been written in the king's name and sealed with his signet ring can never be revoked. This is what the queen was worried all about. She was educated, of course, with the law of the land. She know that the decree is on effect and the days are running so close to their death. She has to do something to stop this law. But how? Let's go to chapter 8. Now here's the fourth appearance of Queen Esther. Then Esther went again before the king, falling down at his feet, and begging him with tears to stop the evil plot devised by Haman the Agagite against the Jews. Let there be a decree that reverses the orders of Haman, son of Hamidata, the Agagite, who ordered that Jews throughout all king's provinces should be destroyed. Then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, I have given Esther the property of Haman and he has been impelled on a pole because he tried to destroy the Jews. Now go ahead and send a message to the Jews in the king's name telling them whatever you want and seal it with the king's signet ring. But remember that whatever has already been written in the king's name and sealed with his signet ring can never be revoked. That's the reason why Queen Esther requested for a reversal order of the decree. What is that decree that needed to be reversed? Let's continue to read. So on June 25, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Mordecai dictated. It was sent to the Jews and to the highest officers, the governors and the nobles of all 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. The decree was written in the scripts and languages of all the peoples of the empire including that of the Jews. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. The king's decree gave the Jews in every city authority to unite to defend their lives. They were allowed to kill slaughter and annihilate anyone of any nationality or province who might attack them or their children and wives and to take the property of their enemies. The day chosen for this event throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes was March 7 of the next year. Let's have a short review and just to remind us, what is that decree dictated by Haman? This is the decree giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. And this was scheduled to happen on March 7 of the next year. In other words, the reversal of this decree has been granted. It was given already to Mordecai and to Queen Esther. Verse 15, Then Mordecai left the king's presence wearing the royal robe of blue and white, the great crown of gold, and an outer cloak of fine linen and purple. 
and the people of Susa celebrated the new decree. The Jews were filled with joy and gladness and were honored. Everywhere in every province and city, wherever the king's decree arrived, the Jews rejoiced and had a great celebration and declared a public festival and holiday. And many of the people of the land became Jews themselves, for they feared what the Jews might do to them. So what happened in March 7, when the Jews in Persia were supposed to be wiped out, it was a turning of the event. They were supposed to be killed, annihilated, and plundered. But what happened? What happened on the day of destruction? It became a day of salvation, a day of defeat and destruction for their enemies. There was a shift of event. Now they're the one killing and destroying their enemies. They are chasing those who hate them. They were the ones plundering, not being plundered. They are the ones destroying, not being destroyed. They were the ones killing their enemies, not being killed. A day of their slaughter became a day of celebration. A day of loss became a day of gain. Their enemy Haman was dead. His children were dead. His wealth was taken from him. His evil decree returned for his destruction, and now he is totally gone. Then Purim was celebrated. As believers and followers of Christ, we also receive a death threat. There's somebody out there who's so furious, like a roaring lion, like a rushing flood. A person without body whose mission is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The Bible calls him also the accuser of the brethren. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. He keeps on accusing the believers. We are threatened to die, renounce our faith, compromise the truth, and live a so-called Christian life. What is a Christian normal life? A Christian normal life is not free of sufferings and trouble. I was talking about this for the past two weeks. Now I'm still talking. Like Haman, we have an enemy who seeks for our destruction. He wants you to remain ignorant to the word of God that makes you free from the slavery or from his slavery and his bondage. As 2 Corinthians chapter 4 said, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The gospel is powered by God. The Lord Jesus died for your freedom. Now you can face your enemy, the devil, and fight the good fight of faith. Because the one who is leading you is Jesus Christ, your commander. He is leading the battle. Attack, Christian soldier. Resist, rebuke, and command the enemy to leave. Destroy all his lies, his robbery, and his deceit. Counterattack the enemy. If he has thrown despair, you have to counterattack with hope. If he throw deception, counterattack with truth. If he throw rejection, counterattack with God's amazing love. According to study, children and teens who are victims of broken homes because of divorce and separation of parents suffered rejection. If the enemy attack you with loneliness, counterattack him with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphan. I heard some people believe that loneliness is a part of life and everybody will feel lonely at some point in time. That's the world view. But how can you be lonely when you know that your Heavenly Father promised not to leave you nor forsake you? The Word of God is in you and the Holy Spirit is with you 24-7 who is willing to hear you, answer you, and fellowship with you. The enemy is robbing your peace, 
making you confused by human reasoning. He is casting doubts so you cannot use your power to rebuke him and leave. He wants the power that you have, but he cannot have it. He wants the inheritance that you have, but he cannot have it. For all spiritual blessings are not earned by works, but they are given free to those who are washed by the blood of the Lamb. If anyone desires to have eternal peace, eternal joy, eternal life must submit to Jesus and acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior. The enemy will not do that. He is in total rebellion against God. And because he knows that he is no much to God, he comes to the people of God like the situation of the Jews. The decree to die is here. Haman hated the Jews because they were different. They were unique and they were faithful to their God no matter what. They are willing to give up their lives even to the point of death and never compromise and bow down to other gods. Haman tried all his best to destroy the Jews, but he failed. His wife and counselor had given up by saying, If Mordecai before you have begun to fall, is of a Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. If you are a real born again Christian and you know your identity in Christ, the enemy who is fighting against you will fall before you because greater is he that is Jesus who is in you than he that is Satan who is in the world. Those who seek to destroy you, your life will be defeated. They will come to you in one way but run seven direction. The enemy whose dream is our destruction will be defeated and we will have the victory. It is the Lord who promised our victory. He who believes that Jesus is Christ overcomes the world. Let's have a short review who we are in Christ. Your identity, my identity in Christ. I am God's child. I have been justified. I am united with the Lord. I am one spirit with Him. I have been bought with price. I belong to God. I am complete in Christ. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. I am a citizen of heaven. I am born of God. And the evil one cannot touch me. I am the soul and the light of the world. I may approach God with freedom and confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's our identity. You should know who you are in Christ. I don't know who is in need of this message. I've been talking about this over and over again. Please listen. Don't devalue yourself. You are not what others think and say, but you are what the Word of God said. You did not choose the Lord, but He chose you for a purpose. The Spirit of the Lord is in you it is in your spiritual DNA to be a winner, not a loser. Queen Esther did not just sit down and wait for their enemy to come and kill them after he knew the decree. First thing she did when the decree was issued, she asked Mordecai and the Jews in Susa to fast for her for three days. She fasted also with her maids and she said after fasting, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Second, she rose up and asked the king for reversal of the decree. You might be thinking in your heart, it's not me who need this. Yes, it might not be you, but have you considered your family, your loved ones, who might be undergoing the attack of the enemy? 
And if your loved ones are under attack, can you say that you are not affected at all? Fight for your family. Fight for your friends. Fight for your neighbors. Queen Esther did. She fought for her people and God saved them. We decree a divine reversal of all satanic transactions that have taken place to devalue and misrepresent our true identity. That's what we have just read. Who we are in Christ. We have to remind the enemy what kind of people he is trying to destroy. We are a people of power, a people of God, precious, loved, and inscribed on the palm of his hands. Every day there is a death threat from the enemy. Every day is a battle. That's why we need to be covered by God's protection and dress up for war. Every day we have to put on our spiritual weapons. We declare we will not die before our time in Jesus' name. Always remember that if there is a daily battle, there is also a daily victory. Lamentation chapter 3, 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burdens, even the God who is our salvation. The Lord who watches us is commanding our enemies to turn back and be blown like chaff. Psalms 35. The psalmist prayed, O Lord, Oppose those who oppose me. Fight those who fight against me. Put on your armor and take up your shield. Prepared for battle and come to my aid. Lift up your spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Let me hear you say, I will give you victory. Let me hear you say, I will give you victory. Yes, the Lord did. Those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God overcomes the world. Let's continue in verse 4. Bring shame and disgrace on those trying to kill me. Turn them back and humiliate those who want to harm me. Blow them away like chaff in the wind. A wind sent by the angel of the Lord make their path dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God, who is our victory. Thank you, Lord, for the victory that you have given to us. Let us pray. Oh, Father, thank you that we know who we are in you. Always remind us that if we are facing a situation like this, call us into your presence. And when we are in your presence, Lord, spending time with you, we can hear from you. You will remind us of your words and you will remind us of who we are. Thank you for giving us power over the enemy. And we know that we are victorious. Instead of dying, you allow us to live. And instead of being defeated, you allow us to win. Thank you that you are the one 
who can change our situation. Even death, you can turn it into life. I thank you and I praise you. We know who we are in you. We are powerful people. We are chosen people. We are anointed. And we are victorious. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Join us again next week. And remember that God has given you power over your enemy. God bless you.